Are you going to love this book? All of this book? We discuss what we like about it and all the cool stories. This week, Three Sides of the Coin. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I am one of your co-hosts, Michael Brandvold, and I'm joined by Tommy Summers and Mitch LaFon. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you guys? Good. Good. Mitch gives us three. Tommy gives us two. (laughs) What do you give us? One? (laughs) What happened to the days of we're joining from... You know, Tommy from Minnesota. I miss those days. You miss having your ego stroked? Well, no, Tommy from Minnesota is not my ego. Yeah, but that usually then leads into the world renowned illustrious. I figure I didn't you can say that. I figure you but can stroke sure, yourself you more than enough every day. That. I don't need to do <laughs> he it. He does. I don't need to do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Let's see if we can get through thirty seconds without Mitch getting hard. <laughs> Everybody just be very quiet. Watch if he gets if he gets really pale and all the blood rushes from his head, you'll know. Hey look, Tommy's got another helper back there. Yeah, that's my sister Vicky, by the way, everybody. Hello, Vicky. Hi. How are Vicky you? Vicky sells houses with me and so she's doing some work right now. So, so does she hate Peter Chris? Uh, I don't think she knows who Peter Chris even is. Just tell her to say I hate Peter. No, she don't hate Peter Chris. Who is it? See, who is it? She doesn't know. Well, she that's even care. worse. Who is Peter Chris? <laughs> that's not her. That's not her generation, man. She likes the Beatles. I want to give the Rolling fans Stones. somebody new to, to, to pick on. To, to she doesn't deserve to be flambasted. So that's that's a whole you'll, different you'll, thing. You'll take it. You'll take yeah. it. Mm-hmm. By the way, we love Peter. 1973. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 1979, Peter. We love Peter. Hey, to Vicky was my... Vicky was my backup. If uh, Heidi Harper didn't take me to that in store in Bloomington, Vicky would have done that. See? So, it's a lot more she than gets Mitch's it. mom ever would have done for Mitch. Yeah, that's a whole nother. So she deal. did drive me from Montreal to New York for that interview. That was pretty yeah. good. Mm-hmm. And then a month later, she drove me back to New York to see Kiss at the Palladium. Come on, that's pretty awesome. And uh, she that's bought incredibly awesome. You still didn't have lunch with Gene Simmons. No, yeah, but there's still time. That still hurt? Yeah, that is never going to happen. It still hurts <laughs> because never, Gene never, having never. lunch with Gene in 1980 would have been a uh, real experience. Having would Gene you, lunch with Gene now would be fabulous and please you I'm, got I'm available. Letter. Never had. You got the letter though, man. I did. The, That's the pretty cool. Which he's afraid to use now. So, what's the point of having a letter? Yeah, well, but I still got my picture taken with them this year. So. How many times? And How many times three. everyone? 5 in all. 3 this year. Which is less than Mike. Mike's had like 40. No. Well, no. back. No. Not I've, in the official. I've got oh. two pictures with Kiss, and that's it. One that you took your girlfriend, girlfriend now too. wife, and then yeah. one backstage that you shared with us at some point. Oh, there was actually one that was a video still. Oh, was that a video? Well, that sort of counts. I guess. And then I, then I had one at Peter Chris's last show. Where was that again? Ch- Charlotte? That was, no, no that was in... Columbus? Um, uh, Where was that again? Uh, Wasn't it uh, South De- no, no, Carolina? No, it, was or? In, it was in California here. It was the end of the Aerosmith tour. Oh, that's right. There was another tour. That's right. That, that Fresno. Can, um, right, 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 right. Okay. Fresno. I keep thinking about the one in on the farewell tour with the that tear was, that, and That was drum. the last show of the original four. Yes. Peter Chris's last show period was his birthday. Oh. December twenty. Is it December twenty? De- December twentieth. Yeah. Sorry, my to grandmother was December twenty seventh. Two thousand three. Correct. Two thousand three was that tour. Fresno, California. That was his last show. In Kiss. Period. Do you know? And I'll just ask. It has nothing to do with our topic. But did they film any of those shows? Do they have those in a vault somewhere? 
every show is filmed because of the video screens. But is it recorded? Yes. Okay, because I, I know I, backstage you, you have they have the banks and they have the producer going with the different angles. I've seen that. Yep, I remember. God, I don't remember which tour it was. Farewell tour, or maybe like world domination or something. I remember like near the end of the tour, a ginormous pallet sitting in the backstage area waiting for a truck to come pick it up, and it was just stacked with videotapes. And it was all of the, recorded it, shows. It was all the recordings of the video screens and stuff from you know the past few weeks or months or something like that, getting ready to be shipped off somewhere. And you couldn't you have snagged that, the St. Paul show? <laughs> no, but are, are they in a, in a usable form, or is it just a lot of little snippets? Like, well, could they know. actually, I mean... I'm sure, it could, I'm sure it can be edited. It's all, I bet it's it, a it, fully mixed piece. It's, it's, either, yeah. it's either a fully mixed what goes to the screen, or it very well could be three or four raw camera feeds. feeds. Yeah. The question is, though, are the feeds with audio? And that's not always the case with those camera feeds. Sometimes it's just the picture. What? I don't know. I don't know. All I know, and I, just like the Jimi Hendrix thing, I, at some point when Gene and Paul hanging up, I, I'm sure we're just going to get an annual avalanche of, here's, you know, 2003, here's 1979, here's... Here's Mitch um, LaFon. Money, money, money. I'll be buying all that stuff. Though I have to admit, I'm <laughs> less and less interested. You got $140,000 building up in a bank account. It's not there yet. It will get to that That's point said, if my calculations build, are. It's building up. Yeah, well, it's not in my name. It's in my kids' names for their college education. Well, I suppose if they really love you, they would buy their daddy some kiss Kista? concerts. I as agree. As opposed to college education. I agree. Anyway, but there's nothing there now. It's slowly building. I agree. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Who needs college? What you really need is a talent. Yeah. I don't think Donald Trump went to college, did he? Or is it Steve Jobs? I don't know. I don't know. All right. Know. Today's so, show. So, 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 should we start with a comment? Ooh. Tommy? Um... Yeah, I suppose we could. Let me pull it up. I just drink coffee. Hmm. Okay, guys, we are, uh, what, 10 minutes in, and Mitch had his first drink of coffee. People Is that paying, an issue? Yeah, well, people are paying attention to that now. Why? Good. I don't know. Why? Why do KISS fans pay attention to anything? I don't know. I'd like to point out that sure. KISS fans are very interesting. Today, on my Facebook, or recently on my Facebook, I put a picture of me and John 5. And if you read the comments, the first one is, hey, that's John 5. And as we get down to the third or fourth comment, it became a debate about Ace, Ace and Peter Frehley. versus Tommy. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> no, but I could just guess. <laughs> there, was, there were 17 comments where people were bashing each other about KISS, and I'm like... How did this get to be a kiss discussion? God, I don't know. They're good about that, aren't they? They can take a completely to off topic post, not related right. to kiss, turn it into kiss, and then turn it into kiss Ace, passing. Ace versus Tommy, Peter versus Eric, Gene versus Ace. Uh, amazing. The oh, skills. but it also became 70s kiss versus 80s kiss. It was two concurrent, concurrent topics. People right, get worked up. Okay, so well, in with, anyway. well, in leading into that, I'm going to pick one like that. And this one actually isn't funny. It's just kind of. Where's this uh, one come from? This one comes from Facebook because the last one I picked was from um, YouTube. YouTube. Okay. So this one's from John Evans, and it's in reply to what we you just posted today, the latest episode. Which at that time, the people see this was last week's episode. And John says, anybody who wants Eric Singer. In Eric Carr's makeup should be should get beat, quartered, and hollowed out because that's poking a stick at someone who deserves substantially more respect than that. So I thought maybe Mitch, you could explain the hollowed out part, and then we could maybe discuss the whole quote. 
Well, I don't know what he means by hollowed out. You know, I mean, gutted, I guess, is the word. I thought it was the reference to the hand bear. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure if it's a reference to the panda bear, but it could be. But uh, I don't know. I mean, um, how do you Eric guys feel Carr, about that? Eric Carr deserves a lot of respect, but I, I'd argue that Peter Chris deserves just as much well, respect. And none of this has to do anything with respect. It has to do with brand. Yeah, and, I mean that was that. My my thought was as you were reading that is like, oh, so apparently Peter Chris and Ace Frehley deserves zero respect. Which is not true. They deserve a lot of respect. And I don't think that's what he's saying. He just is, I think, a huge fan of Eric Carr. And being that maybe Eric Carr has passed, it's worse to put someone else in his makeup. But again, it goes back to the character. It's not Eric Carr anymore. It's the Fox. So if they were to use that, they're using it as a character. They're not using it as a person. Yeah. And I'm not justifying. I'm just saying it is what it, it is. It comes down to who owns the character. Yeah. Yeah. And also the uh, branding wise, the character wasn't around that long. We had it in 80, 81, 82. By 83 it was gone. It was only around 3 years and 2 of those years they didn't even tour the states. They didn't tour the states in Unmasked. They didn't tour the states with The Elder. They toured it with Creatures. So, mm -hmm. you know, American fans, North American fans never really got to see The Fox, quite frankly. Mhm. Mm One so time. So it's not a very strong image that identifies Kiss, not in the general marketplace. For Kiss fans, yes, it does. But in the general marketplace, you put Gene, Peter, you put those pictures, then you put Ace or the Fox, people go, the hell what is, is that? that? Yeah. Right, and that and that's why I picked this particular one, just simply because of the fact that I don't I don't necessarily think it's disrespectful, and you got to be able to understand where they're coming from now and what they're doing and why they're doing it. And right. it's it's a marketing thing. It's not a disrespect to any one particular person, one way or another. You know, and I, I, for me, it's always seemed like there's a lot of comments in 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 that vein, and. It makes sense for a diehard Kiss fan to say that. It does. But you have to take yourself out of being a diehard Kiss fan and be really honest and look at Kiss through the eyes of Joe Schmo on the sidewalk. No, and, it's and, and, through and again, a PR firm on Wall Street. No, no disrespect to Eric Carr at all, but the average person on the street doesn't know who the hell Eric Carr is, especially in and makeup. And much less the makeup. In, especially in makeup. Mm -hmm. That's no disrespect. They just don't know. They don't care that much about Eric Carr in makeup. No, I as a diehard Kiss fan, it's really important to us. It means a lot it to is. us. But you know what? It does. We are small compared to the majority of the music population that's out there. And and you have to, if you want to have a a rational discussion, you have to be able to take yourself out of you being a diehard fan and look at it through the eyes of the average music fan. And that's the problem think, with all this. Do you think, and I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway, do you think that Gene and Paul were purposefully disrespectful to Ace and Peter by putting on the makeup on Eric and Tommy? No. 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 Not and, at all. And not They're at all. They're making a business decision that work, makes the best sense for their business. That's right. why they did it. And so, you know, and I, I'm If they really go, wanted to be disrespectful... They'd have two guys dressed up as Vinnie Vincent, and that would be thumbing their nose. But it's another that's not buck. what it's about. Another it's buck. Not about. <laughs> but that's not what it's about. It's about branding. True, but I'll even take it one step further and say to you that there's a lot of people in the general public that only know Eric Carr's name because he happened to die the same day that Freddie Mercury died. Yeah. You know, there's just a lot of people outside of the fan base don't really know who he is, no matter how nice and wonderful and talented he is or was. It... And and before we get a lot of hate mail, let's. I'm gonna just state, for, at least for me, he's a great drummer. He was a great person. He was exceptionally kind and all that stuff. It's not a discussion about him, the person. We're just talking about well, the branding matter, and the makeup. I know that for a fact. I've gotten. I've gotten roasted by what's her face's name on Facebook, who insisted I hated Eric, even though I kept saying I have no issues with Eric. But I'm even no. wearing I'm even Eric <clears throat> wearing Eric on on my shirt today. Look at that. Here, here's an interesting question. Over my heart. And 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 I will right now because I know I'm going to have to do it to make this question. I will 
pony up my. Okay. So, which fans are the most, and I don't know how you want to describe it, crazy, radical, devoted, passionate, are in, in, in ranking of the most to the least? Well, the most um, is. So, so yeah, I was going to say, in my opinion, Vinnie Vincent. Here's my dollar mm -hmm. to the buying of a pink guitar. Mm -hmm. Vinnie Vincent fans are the absolute craziest, nuttiest, freakiest, passionate, whatever you want. Right. Mm -hmm. Then I oh. would say Ace Fraley fans. Mm -hmm. See, I, I'm I'm thinking maybe Ace fans are even crazy, but no, no, no. But so mm. there, there's a, there's a louder voice in a bigger group of the Ace Fraley fans. Yeah. But they're not nearly as crazy as the smaller group of the Vinny fans. Then I think you got Peter Chris. I, I think then it's I almost think you equal. got Well, you know what? Actually, even before Peter Chris, I think you've got the um, the Gene Simmons slash Paul Stanley Kool Aid drinkers. And then maybe Peter Chris. You know, I think that that you even have to put something in between that, and it's the original four, just as a concept, goes ahead of the individual band members, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, well, it does, there are people but I'm, that are I'm, crazy. I'm only, I'm only discussing individual band members. So I, I'm seeing Vinny, Ace. It's Gene. another buck. All right. I'll, just, I'll throw a fiver in. Okay. Yeah. I think that'll cover Ace, you. Ace, Gene slash Paul, Peter. Eric Carr, and then everything else. Right. Well, and Eric Carr, you know, the times that I met him was very, very kind. I thought he was an incredible musician, very nice person, smart, you know, perfect for the band. I can't say enough good about him. So that's not what this is about. No, We're just not, simply not, not, not at all. And you know, I'm, yeah. and and this is just me making an observation because. We see all of these quote posts that we put up there, and you know, and, and and for whatever reason, I'm always the magnet for a lot of the the hatred and the attacks. Yeah, and, and we and, like it that way. And Mitch likes it that way. Oh no, Tommy too. Don't no, Tommy's Tom yell not, at us. Tommy's not afraid of it. No, but he doesn't. But we prefer that. But we both but do. I I think you got not the two the two guitar players are one and two. Right. Well, look at my sister. I mean, she's the general public. She doesn't know who Peter Chris is. No. You know, and she she knows about music. You know, she's responsible for giving me a but lot I, of I great bet if you records when it's going on. Oh, them. she knows. Oh, definitely she but knows. She but she know doesn't, their name. doesn't know their names. Mm -hmm. Doesn't register for them. So and in the same manner as it doesn't for her, it doesn't for young, you know, younger people now in their twenties or whatever. It, that's and that's kind of the point. I feel like we're always trying to make on this podcast is, look, you know, we're not trying to enrage you. It's just we're simply saying if you're going to have the argument, you have to step outside of being a fan or a diehard fan to have the discussion because the majority of the world doesn't think the same way. And speaking of arguments, I would love to read a quote that I just posted today on my Facebook wall that okay. that applies so well to our world. Okay. So this quote comes from, and you can't argue with this man, comes from Spock. Spock. <laughs> Spock. Like Leonard, Leonard Nimoy? No, the new a Spock. Spock? Spock or the, new, the, new, Spock. the new Spock. The the The... Um, the traitor, the whatever you want to call him, new Spock. Okay, I don't know what you're talking about. The guy, the guy wearing the new ears. In okay. The new, in the new movie. Oh yeah. So, so Spock is. makes a comment that says, "Reverting to name calling suggests you are defensive, and therefore you find my opinion valid." Hmm. Doesn't that apply very nicely it to does. a lot of what we deal with every once in a while? Yeah. yeah, more more you than Mitch and I. But even you even do. even amongst you do. Other, you even just... amongst other Kiss fans, when they start having their discussions mm -hmm. on our threads, and mm -hmm. one will start calling another, you know, names. It's like, ah, oh, okay, that's basically you just admitting you've lost the argument, and the other person's right. 
Mm-hmm. It's just amazing how it just gravitates to you like water bouncing off the shore. Yeah, I know. It's just like, whoa. It's because I don't care if they call me names. I've been called so many names in the last Doesn't matter. 20 yeah. years. Mm-hmm. And nobody calls fans. Tommy and I names because they love us. No, yeah. they call you fanboy. They call you fanboy. Yeah. That's but that's okay. good, though. That's 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 a, that's that's a, a uh, term of that. endearment. I'll take it is. fanboy. Yeah. All right. Well, so should we move on yeah, to today's so let's, topic? Let's move on to today's topic. So as twenty-five we, minutes. We're still in. listening. As, as, as we as we uh, hinted to last week, we all three got a copy of the brand new book "Nothing to Lose" by Ken Sharp, Gene Simmons, and Paul Stanley. And the first thing I'd like to point out is that the photo that's on the cover of the versions you guys have. Okay. Look, you can barely see Peter Chris, and that's inside the book. But, aha, they photoshopped it and fixed Peter so you can see him. So hold yours up close to the camera, Mitch. Let me see. I can still see Peter there. Yeah, I still can. But he's, he's much more predominant than he was. Yeah, he's half dark in mine, and in yours he yeah. seems to be much more... Yeah, and they yeah, they moved his whole head but, this but, way. But you know that that's not uncommon. No, it's cool that they actually I mean, did that. I've seen. I remember the um, remember the original Alive Four album that got shelved and then finally got released a few mm-hmm. years ago. Right. That that cover artwork was completely photoshopped together from like four different individual photos. And you don't even have to look at the, the, the album covers. Their calendars every year are all photoshopped. They're yeah. cut and paste well, and, from and, different and, things. And because the big deal, the big reason is it's very rare you're ever going to get a single photo that's got Eric Singer, four guys. Peter Chris, the drum, whoever's the drummer will very rarely ever be in the same photo as the front three guys. Right. They're, right. And they're, or if he is, he's so far back in the distance, he's too small. So they always end up photoshopping and manipulating, especially the drummer. Pull, they might take his photo and pull it up and enlarge it. And if you look at it from a perspective standpoint, it's just like that perspective doesn't work on a live stage. But they, they need to do that to give the guy some visibility. Right. Hey, uh, Tommy, do me one favor. Hmm. Go to page 317. I'm curious to see what they've done. Just curious to see what, what yours looks like. And I'll show you mine here. This is a picture of Paul, but it's so pixelated you, that it's, it's hard to make out any detail. And, of course, all the text Let me is, see it again. 317. And then then we'll get to the discussion about this. Yeah, let's see what yours looks like. You can't really see the the pixelation, but it's... it's, Yeah, see, mine is um, crystal clear. But that, Mitch, that's... And mine's the same way, even though I've got the e-book. That's just because we've got what's basically a pre-release copies. Right, it says uh, uncorrected. Yeah, it could be the low-res photo that's just in there for placement only, and it's going to get... It's for placement. It's going to get replaced with the high-res for the final one and stuff like that. So anyway, the... I I do want to just say that as part of my discussion about the book, mine's an uncorrected proof, which means that some of the pictures aren't high-res and some of the, you know, they might have changed a sentence or two. So my opinion is based on this book this version of it so i don't know how much it'll affect it but maybe a little bit and i got the same thing as mitch except i didn't get a physical i got a, a ebook so i could read it while i was fishing last week and tommy got the actual final version of it so, which is actually smart because they gave us three different versions yeah whether they did it on purpose or not uh, no nobody's that purposeful no. okay. luck of the draw Okay. I was supposed to get a physical, and it hasn't shown up yet either. So, okay. um, so anyway, the the publisher, who's the publisher, Harper Collins, yep, um, was very kind and and sent us books to read in advance, so we could record a show. We're recording this on September third, and it'll be posted on September tenth. That's the day the book drops, mm-hmm. um, and. 
I want to start this because I know somebody's going to freaking make this comment. I want to start this by saying I don't work for KISS anymore. Mitch doesn't. Tommy doesn't. They don't I'm pay available us. though. They don't pay us. They don't. We get no money. We get no support. They have nothing to do with this show. Got it? They they might not even know it exists for all we know. So they have no contact with this show. We're not doing this to kiss Gene and Paul's ass is what it comes down to. You are hearing what the three of us think of this book. If we like it, that's because we like it. If we don't like things, it's because we don't like things. We're not saying things because HarperCollins gave us a free book and that we want to make Gene and Paul happy. Clear? Huh. Yep. I'm sure some people will still think we're bullshit lying yeah. there, but I don't care at that point. So that being said, let's um, let's just kind of do a quick round table here of absolute first impression of the book. What you know, as a Kiss fan, what do you think of the book? Well, let's start. Well, it's a, okay. Um, you know, the version I have is is over 500 pages. And um, I don't think it needs to be. I think they could have told the story more effectively in about 250 pages and made it much tighter. There was a lot of repetition. And the first 10 chapters where it gets into the minutia of the Coventry Club and how many coats of paint on the wall there are, and I'm not even kidding, they talk about nine coats of paint, it's like, that, that doesn't really advance the KISS story for me. It's just a bunch of, yeah, okay, there were rats and there were cockroaches, but I don't care. It, it, it's nothing to do about it. Anyway, so my first impression basically is there's some good, a lot of good, the later chapters, and there's a lot of bad, but there's also just a lot of fluff. They could have unfluffed it and given me something more precise, more to the point. Tommy? That's what I think of you saying that. I think it was freaking brilliant. I love the detail. That's like saying, uh, Stephen King, don't tell us about this setup. Just have the guy kill everybody and be over with it. I liked the detail. I liked the minutia. I liked all of that because what they were trying to do by the way it was set up was they were trying to say, this is what it felt like when we walked into the loft. I mean, Binky described what it was like to go to that 23rd Street loft and how dank it was and how there was only one light bulb that was on in the whole hallway and you're just like where the hell are we going i love that kind of stuff so you, you can don't skip need through 10 it. chapters of it it was 10 chapters no, of it. no 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 i gotta call you i gotta call bullshit on that it's 10 chapters on 10 different things it wasn't 10 chapters on the coventry right oh it just keeps coming over and over and over again it, it, it's tedious the first I, 10 chapters I, are. I, I got to say, first impression, and, you know, I kept thinking, all right, how, how would I sum up this entire book? We'll go into some greater discussion in a bit here. I felt like this book was opening up a time capsule that in 1975, Kiss had the forethought to create you and, and maybe some people don't even know what the hell we're talking about but it, i mean the three of us that used to be something schools would do a lot is you'd create a time capsule mm -hmm. your third grade class would put a bunch of crap into a metal canister and they would bury it in the back and it would be opened in 20 years as a time capsule i felt like this book was opening up a time capsule that kiss buried in 1975 with all sorts of interesting little tidbits and facts and and stories and photos and and stuff like that that it was like wow that that is very cool i thought it was great to to get the picture painted of how dingy and nine coats of paint on the on the wall of the country because that reminds me of clubs i've been in and now i can sort of picture myself there i 
as, That's how I felt. As as a Kiss fan, I've always wondered for the last 40 years what it would be like to have been there right. at the Coventry but, or, or, or at Cadillac, Michigan, or at any of these other events from from up, um, up until 75, or to meet somebody who had been there and talk to that just average fan who was just fortunate enough, for whatever reason, to walk into the Coventry that night, and they were one of ten people to see this band called Kiss. And and yeah, I felt you know, like this book really brought that out and allowed me to 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 become part of that. Mm-hmm. Right, and I agree with that sentiment. But it could have been brought out in a more efficacious way. It didn't have to be so drawn out. It was just on and on and on. It's like, yeah, okay, we got that Binky was at the call, but we got that so and so. We got it. Let's move on to something more substantial. It it. It could have been done. You could have gotten that feeling, and it could have been three pages rather than thirty pages. See, I, it, I, I would actually say I, w- I wish it was longer. Yeah, I, oh, I guess God for clarification, me. though, of what Mitch is trying to say for because most of you are not going to see this even by the time this airs, is that I like the way Ken set this up because not only is there quotes in here from Gene and Paul, but there's also quotes from Ace and Peter, uh, all the different people who were associated from roadies to friends to all this. And so as it was put together, if you're talking about going to see them in the loft, for instance, as soon as you're done reading that part that Binky mentions, then it goes right to somebody else who he was with who said, and this is my perspective. So that's where the drawn out piece comes from, but I think it's longer just simply because they're giving everybody a chance to speak their mind and reminisce what they remember of that particular period in time. I, I don't know. I, I love the way it was yeah, put together. It's the most in-depth book we've got on them now. I, 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 I agree. It is, to me, it, it's better than any other Kiss book that's been written. Um, it gets to that in the end. After you get past the first 10 chapters into the Casablanca and all, it gets to that, but the beginning is 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 just god awful. I mean, it really is I gotta, truly I god awful. Completely disagree. I think, I think the beginning chapters, ev- everything. I was just like, this is great. I can't. Who's the next person whose name is going to show up? I mean, let let let's be clear. This is not a Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley book. Yes, they are here, but um, Ken interviewed. 200 people mm-hmm. true but a lot together. of them I a lot of them I just didn't care about I mean it's like ooh Rick Fox early kiss fan who cares I do who the fuck's Rick Fox I don't I, do I, I, I Rick Fox was the guy that was there when we weren't yeah that's the whole point I do care because and I don't care that he is a well in Rick Fox's case he went on to be a musician but there are other people who are just clearly in you know People of no I know, and it's, now. it's just funny that these these people all say, "Oh, we all felt Kiss was gonna be superstars." And you know what? If you read a wrote a New York uh, Dolls book or a Bratz book, they'd probably all be saying the same thing. I mean, hindsight is is great foresight. Uh, you you know, can't fault them for that. I mean, that's just no, but you know what they think. You well, know, they think you it can't... because of the context here. You're writing a Kiss book, or, or they were being interviewed in a Kiss context. They all knew they were going to... They didn't know they were going to be famous. Mitch sounds like the KISS fan who's going to find a way to trash this book. Yeah, you're no, peeing I, in the I, punch I bowl, my friend. The last, I love the last half of it. The beginning is tedious. There are a lot of characters that I don't care about. And they're, they're, the context of the quotes disturbs me as well because there's a quote in there where Gene says stuff about Ace and Peter being you know, substance abusers. If that quote is said in 1985, I can agree with him. If it's said in 2013, I would take issue with it. So, And not having the context of where that quote comes from changes my opinion of how I think about it. And, and we're not given that ability to judge based on from a 1979 interview, from a 1985 interview. It's just back and forth, back and forth. And it's, it's all these different interviews laid out together and sometimes you need context to have to have to have it have meaning i i didn't i didn't feel that at all i mean i i i actually felt 
you know, and I'll be honest, there was some Gene and Paul being critical of Ace and Peter. Not, yes. not heavily at all, but there was some very admitted, hey, these guys had problems, they were messed up. But what I found interesting is that they seem to have recognized that issue as far back as the formation of the band. But that's it. Right. The quote I'm referring to, you, you don't know if that quote was done in 1977. You'd go, oh, wow, they knew as far back. But if it was done last week... Yeah, but that's but talking, this is a look. This is a look back, it's a look man. Back, Mitch. They're <laughs> talking. Of, they're talking about 1973, and he's yeah. saying, "Yeah, you know, one year into the band, we were recognizing that there were issues." Yeah, Ken was four probably when they were doing this, so it's like, yeah, <laughs> what do you want? Okay, let no, that no, four-year-old no. in. He's gonna. He's got his crayons. He's gonna start taking notes. I mean, you know, that's all part of that. Like, here's what I find interesting. I'm gonna read a little thing Hold for on. you. All right. Um, Eddie Solon talks, and this is the kind of stuff that is interesting to me. He said, not long after the Bleecker Street Loft Party show, I treated the band to tickets to see Alice Cooper at Madison Square Garden in June of 73. They were starting to be compared to Alice Cooper, and we wanted them to see a professional concert with theatrics. Uh, they dressed up like rock stars, went as a band. People looked at them, and they were wondering, who are these guys? They must be somebody. Peter, Chris, and I were sitting, uh, or excuse me, were drinking scotch in a flask, and they caught Peter trying to sneak the flask in and confiscate it, but I was able to sneak in mine. All right. So after that, then the, the next two pieces come from Peter and Paul. And Peter says, I sat in the back, and Paul and Ace literally ran all the way down the stairs to be right up front of the stage. That's how impressed they were. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. And then Paul Stanley goes on to say, um, you know, seeing that show was. Uh, was stunning. I still remember him walking down those stairs when the show began with "Hello, Hooray," and it was godlike, and on and on and on. So, I mean, it it's like a, it's almost like having an ongoing conversation with anywhere from five to twenty people about every specific event that occurred from the inception of the band all the way up into '75. So, I, I don't understand. It's like getting what, into the it's getting into the minds of some young kids who four of them are in the band and dozens of them are hanging out surrounding these four kids. And, and it's just kind of feeling the, I don't know, the raw, naive energy, excitement of it. it it's, it was just very interesting to sit there and read that stuff and go, wow, fast forward to where Kiss is today. Holy crap. Right. That, that, that description, they're talking about this band that has sold 100 million albums around the world and has got sold out tours and plays stadiums and arenas and here's discussing them playing how, how about the how about the story where they played the private event for the library in Staten Island yeah that was yeah i mean but, but it was just that type of stuff level. going what what you know it's like going inside the minds of them but not just them the people who were there morley safer was at that event that was very cool. And, they got a con and there's a comment from Morley Safer here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that, to me, that's what, that's what really makes this gold is, yeah, there's some great stuff from Gene, Paul, Peter, Ace here. But you, you could have taken them out of this whole book, and all of the other surrounding stories are the absolute gold to me of that person who owned the club, their dad owned the club, this was the person that did this. The road crew people, the other bands, the that toured other with them. bands, the other musicians that that had comments to say about Kiss. Right, but this is all the stuff later on. This is after the first ten chapters, and that's where the book really takes off and becomes exceptionally interesting. Yeah, that said, you still don't need five hundred pages to tell this story. You don't need 500 pages to tell the story. It could have been told very efficiently in 250 pages. There's a lot of fluff. I think there's you needed too another, much fluff. I think you needed 250 more pages to. I yeah. want. I want to see the interviews that got cut out because they they didn't have enough pages. I mean, I, there's just. I don't know. This is the type of thing that I, I just. I'll say it again. As a Kiss fan, I've always for 30 years wondered what it would have been like to be at the Coventry when Kiss first played or at their first tour? Or how about the great stories about their first Canadian tour from the promoters and those type of people? 
those were very interesting, but those they were came two after or three pages. You got the story, chapter, and we yeah. moved on. The can the, the it was a whole chapter about the Canadian. But are tour. you in like a rush to get somewhere? Or are you saying it just because we had to write read it quickly? Because I, I, I to me this is like the kind of thing that you I savor and take my time and this read through it. This is the kind of it. thing I'm going to have to go back and read a second and third mm-hmm. time because there's clearly stuff that I haven't quite picked up on and. I haven't pictured it fully in my mind of what was going on there. This is this is a multi-read book. This isn't just read it once, put it down, and you got a couple good quotes out of it. And for those of you that don't know Ken, he is a very uh, big fan. And I was told, even when he was doing like the behind the mask and stuff, even then he knew well before that that he was going to write a book. And so every time he would interview any musician, I don't care if it was Robert Plant or, um, you know, whoever it is, he'd always ask him, what do you think of Kiss? I was like, wow, what a great idea to have that kind of, you know, body of quotes. Yeah. And, and, and he, I don't know, he really painstakingly put this together. I, I don't know. I think it's, I think you can't be a Kiss fan and not buy it. Well, no, you, I mean, you have to buy it. But, and to be fair, I have an uncorrected proof. That means that it hasn't been fully edited. So there Ooh. might be some... Well, they didn't edit that, out 250 pages, Mitch. No, they didn't edit out <laughs> 250 pages, but they might have tightened up some sections that might make it more readable. But And again, I'll say it, from about chapter 11, 12, all the way to the end, which is still about 350 pages, it becomes very intriguing and, and a very good read. But the first 150, 200 pages with the Daisy and Coventry, Daisy Coventry, Daisy Coventry. I mean, at some point, I just wanted to scream. I mean, it was bloody tedious. And it was like, oh, now we're interviewing a concert attendee. Really? I don't care. Move along. Yeah, but if someone, if if 40 people are killed at a school, are they going to talk to the dead people or the people that witnessed the shooting? It's like you want to talk to the you know, different people that are there that are a concert goer because they're going to have a different perspective than one of the roadies are. And that's what I found interesting. Plus, too, at the back, he does a thing called cast of characters where he goes through alphabetically everybody that's in the book and explains who they are. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I just – so and you and always and have and a point so of reference. So everyone knows, that at least according to the book I've got, there's 36 chapters. Um, the first – Guys, let's compare. Tommy, is that what you got? You have 36 yeah, chapters? Yeah, 36 chapters, Mitchie. And Ca- the last Ca- page of- before the cast of characters is page 524. And, and Casablanca starts around yeah. chapter 12. Right, and that's where it gets really interesting. See, I, I disagree. I thought it was so much interest in the the Daisy and Rocksteady and, and the, the Loft and... I don't know. And, just hearing from the, the the fans that happened to stumble into this show, it was just yeah. Cold. Well, and cold. then let's talk about the photos, all the stuff that we've never seen. I'm going to show one right now. Look at this. That's Paul Stanley recording the first Kiss album at Bell Studios. I've never yeah. seen that photo. No, and no, there's the some are great. really cool stuff in here. I don't know. I was just I love that kind of detail because it's it, it like what Mike like we said it puts you there. And to me, the stuff before even Casablanca is was more important to me because I want to know what it's like before they got to the record deal. I've ha- heard oh, a yeah. hundred times about the stories of of uh, Bill Coin and you know all that type, which is still great to read. But to me, that was the fascinating piece was that early on stuff. Yeah, really, very much so for me too. Yeah. So I mean, some of the earlier on stuff that I found interesting was they were talking about how kids were playing covers in their shows, or they played one cover. Was it uh, King Crimson? What was the cover they were doing? Oh no, Moody Blues. Yeah, they were doing Moody Blues covers, and they've never recorded. And then they also had the uh, what was that song? Uh, something from the woods. Uh, Life in the woods. Life in the woods. Life in the woods. To know that they had other songs that didn't make it, that I found interesting, but. Just this continual kiss New York Dolls Alice Cooper, kiss New York Dolls Alice Cooper for 10 chapters. I was like, yeah, okay, we get it. They were not the New York Dolls. They were not Alice Cooper. Yeah, yeah, I got, I got See, it. I, 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 let's, lo- let's I loved move hearing along. about the other bands that supported them or they supported and what they thought of each other. 
because what it's actually driving me to do now is look up these bands on Spotify or RDO, and I want to see what these guys sound like because many mm -hmm. of them have released one or two albums. Mm -hmm. well, they, this they, they didn't go on to success like Kiss did, but it's like, what what about that album? Does, you know, like, okay, I've heard of Status Quo and Slade. I've never right. really given them a heavy listen. But after right. reading this book and hearing the immense influence those two bands have had on Kiss, mm -hmm. I'm, going Slade, back, I'm, I'm going back and actually not just listening, but paying attention to it going, okay, I can see where that's now coming from. Yeah, that was a bit shocking because Kiss has always been compared to sort of, they did the Beatles thing of four guys and four identity. This whole Slade comparison, that I had never heard of before. Not, really? not in this Well, not in this context where Gene is really talking about we were trying to imitate. Yeah, we I, were, I hadn't because... heard it this deep coming from the band themselves. I've heard it yeah. mentioned in passing that, oh, yeah, we've always liked Slade or we've liked Status Quo. But now it was like... Wow, these guys are like hugely influenced by them. I think it's because it's forty years on, so they can say that they were trying to do this, they were trying to do that, and it doesn't take away what they did. No, I, but I, back yeah. then, you don't want to share too much of what you're doing with someone because you're trying to make your own name. Right. And what that's I find the kind of stuff, you know. What, go ahead. I, what I find interesting in this discussion, though, is how it shows that we're we're different fans. I've always been about, like I say, when I collect, I collect the CDs and I collect the music. And so if you've noticed, the stuff I'm pointing out is Life in the Woods, the Moody Blues. Yeah. When Paul I was, talks I was, about I was gonna Lover. Bring, I was going to bring that up as you were mentioning that. because yeah. When the, Paul know, talks about Lover All I Can is a Naz song that they, that they reconfigured. And Tommy has his int it, It's interesting how we have our little niches because. Mm -hmm. I, 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 found that, I found music. that stuff cool, but not like, oh, wow, cool. Right. I, I'm more See, in, and that's where I went. Wow. I was more in the, oh, wow, talk about the the experience, the moment. I mean, here's another great story. I don't know if you got to this one yet, Tommy. Um, when they played Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Oh. And after the show in Hawaii, Gene, Paul, and Peter went to a local club and hung out at this club after hours. And as Gene states, it's the first time Kiss ever got up on stage and performed out without makeup because they got up and jammed that night with the local band. Now, Peter left. Peter had enough of it. But Gene and Paul and Ace, right, mm -hmm. stayed and jammed, and they ended the night with rock and roll all night. And they interviewed the drummer of this local house band that played there. Holy shit. <laughs> I mean, how, and do, how you, do they find him? How That's do you find a, yeah. him? How do you track him down? And that story is gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and that's interesting because we all know Kiss went to great, great lengths to not be seen without makeup and photographed. But they obviously had to. People obviously knew them without makeup, but we didn't as fans. And so to hear them on stage jamming with people that could have given away the whole kit and caboodle, you're like, wow, that's kind of cool. And then the other one, when they were at some club, I think it was in Atlanta, and the mafia boss said, "Oh yeah, I the want... mafia boss's son wanted a picture with Kiss." And yeah, <laughs> and they went. The guy, the guy no, probably got the first picture with Kiss out of makeup ever. Yeah, and the guy goes, "We don't do that." And then the the mafia boss went, "Oh yes, you do." And they went, "Yeah, okay, no problem." Hey, that's interesting because. You know, that yeah. never surfaced that picture, and it could have. The other interesting stuff was comments. It's probably in the end zone with Jimmy Hoffa and there Giant go. Stadium. Um, going back to other bands and musicians, I don't know if you picked up on it, but there were a number of them that would say, oh, yeah, you know, our roadie came out and said, you've got to see what this fucking band is doing. Right. And they go out and stand on the side of the stage, and their comments are basically, across the board, all bands were like, holy shit. We've never seen anything like this before. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. from from Journey to Ted Nugent to Black Sabbath to you name it, big, small bands were all saying the same thing. And then they would say, like, the next day, they're hanging out at the restaurant, and this guy in long black hair and leather pants comes up and says, hey, it was great seeing you last night. Pleasure meeting you. And he's like, who are you? Well, I'm, I was Gene, I'm Gene Simmons. These guys, the bands never recognized Kiss outside of the makeup. 
all of a sudden it's just like this long haired guy walking up saying, hey, thanks for playing with us or thanks for having us open for you or whatever. And they're like, who, who are you? Mm-hmm. And it is nice to notice that also that Gene and Paul, you know, as I've known him, you know, with the limited contact, they're always really nice. You know, like when Gene sent that letter to me, and you know, they've always been really nice to whoever you are, whatever your status is. And you get that sense through the book you that do. they were nice to all the promoters. They were nice. And, and you know, and that's how they make it. And, and there's two bands in particular that, that struck me is their stories about Aerosmith. It, I mean, it, it really appears that Aerosmith are a bunch of assholes if you look at what they were doing. And you read the stories with Rush. Oh, and yeah. And I'm not a Rush fan, but suddenly... Jesus, I I like, lo- I've got massive respect for Rush even more. Oh, so. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Totally. I mean, I, I suddenly am feeling all warm and googly inside for Rush because they seem to be on the same level as Gene and Paul in terms of you respect everybody. You you say nice. You say you know thank you. And I mean one and, one of, one of the com- what what Mitch is getting to is one of the common threads that was 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 stated by many bands was if you were opening for Kiss, they treated you with respect. They gave and you they a still sound, do. They gave you a sound check. They didn't take lights away from you. They didn't take sound away from you. But we would go out and we'd open for Aerosmith and we wouldn't get shit. Or we'd mm-hmm. open for this band and we wouldn't get shit. So all of these bands remembered that from day one about KISS, about how KISS wasn't afraid to let these bands be the best they can because as these bands would then see KISS performing, they'd be like, holy crap, they're just out to kill. Mm-hmm. When yeah. these, and, and, and that leads up to the other thing that sort of hit me is, you know, okay, so I came into oh. KISS 76. They'd already been huge. Huge productions, huge everything. And we've, through our lives as KISS fans, it's always been over the top. And you've always heard, well, KISS has been the groundbreakers. They did this before anybody else. And you sort of like, yeah, okay, kind of tongue-in-cheek, that's PR. But, man, so many of these bands and promoters and, and clubs were saying, we had no idea what was happening. All of a sudden, this band comes in here, and they've got an entire road crew and a separate truck of gear and their own lights and their own PA and lots of stories about how their logo wouldn't fit on the stage or was split in two on each side. Lots of pyro. And you're just like, I came away with the impression of, holy cow, these guys really did yeah, break ground with the show production back mm-hmm. then. It really does seem like Nobody was doing it before them. Well, and that's the interesting thing because you're getting this perspective from these different bands and many of them are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at this point. Yet you have these musicians who may not, may or may not like the music, but a lot of them said they generally thought they had good hooks and all of, all of the stuff you would need to have a great song and they liked the, the presentation, yet they're also supposed to be the people that are helping to vote for all of this sort of thing like with Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So mention to everybody about the quote we were talking about before we got on air here regarding Rolling Stone. Yeah, so there, there's a section in here. I think it was around the chapter Cadillac, can, Michigan. Can I stop you for one yeah. second just finish mm-hmm. off on our last thought? The point being about Kiss being nice to everybody is if as you read this, you get a sense of all these bands that were mean to Kiss and mean to other opening acts that don't exist. They didn't have longevity. Right. And then you look at the bands that That's were nice point. and they have longevity. And as a rock reporter, I've been around a lot of bands that are still around from the 80s and stuff. And the one common thread is that the ones that are successful, and this holds true for just outs, are the people that are nice to their opening acts, that are nice to their reporters, that are nice to the to everybody that, that they need to be nice to. And the bands that disappear and break up are just made of assholes. So the lesson learned is just treat everybody nicely and fairly. And Kiss has, you know, raised the bar in that respect. And and also, and, and I've and I've said this on this show, and I've said this at speaking engagements. To this day, Kiss still do that. Oh, absolutely. I, 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 you know, when I was working with them, I have a specific memory. It was up in Toronto, Canada, when Paul was opening up for the Phantom of the Opera. And I think mm-hmm. he did an in-store at a Tower Records in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of kids were there. 
and I have this distinct memory. I'm there taking photos of him for Kiss Online, and there were some of the local paper photographers were there at the end of the table trying to get pictures of him. He stopped, went over, and specifically took time to pose and give these guys what they needed. And mm -hmm. they still do that to this day. And, mm -hmm. and that's because they treat them, they treat them right. They right. Give, and they have longevity. They have longevity. And, and, and Rush does the same thing. And a lot of the bands I know do that. And honestly, after reading this book, I'm surprised that Aerosmith still exists if that's the attitude they had as far back as the early 70s. I mean, Aerosmith is the exception to the rule because the Bratz and, and the New York Dolls and all these bands that are mentioned who were not so nice vanished. And that's what happens. Yep. Yep. Now, back to Rolling Stone. Sorry. I just so there, to there was, there's okay. a no, that was what was worth going over. There's a chapter. Because um, I couldn't I find the exact up. quote. There's a chapter, oh, chapter yeah. somewhere around Cadillac, Michigan. There's a whole discussion about the whole Cadillac, Michigan event. And right. Carol, Carol Ross, who was in the, I think, Kiss's publicist at the time, I, I think after it ta starts talking about press, and it's not specifically about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, because obviously mm -mm. that didn't exist back then. No, But it I'm, was that's... in general about Jan Winter and Rolling Stone and how Rolling Stone from day one just never cared about Kiss. Yeah, Never no. cared about them from day one. Cream did. Circus did. The magazines that were of the people, for the people, middle class, street magazines got it. Rolling Stone always tried to be something bigger and better and, and you know, trying to... I, I, we, we all, as KISS fans, we all know. And that existed from day one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He hated the band for no particular reason and continues to hate them. And he's the gatekeeper to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Thank you so, for that. Yeah, then that, that's what I, that's the point I was trying to make, or that's what was is the tie-in, because I had that discussion with a friend of mine who knows one of the people that's on the committee, and this particular person said that you know they didn't say this to me, but I've heard this before that they will do whatever it takes to keep them out. Yeah, because they don't believe they're real. They think it's a joke band. They don't believe that they deserve to be anywhere near Led Zeppelin or the Beatles or whomever that they, their favorites are. Madonna, you know? <clears throat> whatever. Yeah, but you know, Run there's nothing. MC. But there's nothing wrong with Madonna if that's who you like. But no, she, you know, she's not a rock and roll act. That's the no, thing. Right. It's, it you should know, be called the Music Hall of Fame. Now, now, something else that really hit me. So there's interviews with Bill Coyne in here, and there's there's Neil Bogart and Sean Delaney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is basically a seven-man kiss. Gene Paul, Ace Peter, Bill Coyne, Sean Delaney, and Neil Bogart. Yep. Yeah. It, it, I mean, again, we've always kind of known it, but this book really just cemented that in my mind, that, that is, that's the core of what kiss is. And then it got me thinking, if there ever was to have been a true kiss reunion... You needed those other three guys to be part of the reunion, not right. just Gene, Paul, Ace, and Peter. You needed Bill Coyne, Sean Delaney, and Neil Bogart as part of that puzzle as well. If you were to get a true, let's bring it back together, let's do what it was, let's create the magic, let's get in the studio, you needed those other three guys. Mm -hmm. Should we start a um, Facebook page, Seven Man Kiss? <laughs> but here's the problem. No, It'll I mean, never you know. happen. Because well, three of two of them know. are deceased. Three are deceased. No, I know, but oh, seven three, are deceased. Three of them are deceased. Oh, like the other idea is going to happen. <laughs> well, <laughs> really? at least it's got a, some chance as long as they're still alive. But I mean, so the point here is, you know, no, I, I've never really, you know, Kiss fans always talk about the reunion of Gene, Paul, Ace, and Peter, but it just hit me after reading this that that reunion really needs those other guys to be part of it. Because well, when the reunion so, happened, Bill was around. Bill, Bill was, visited. Bill was around. He visited. I mean, he he went yeah, to I show. Think, I think Sean was still alive then. I'm not yeah, sure. ninety ninety six. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Only Neil was. Yeah. But it just yeah. it just it hit to me how much those guys were. 
part of the band in right. the formation and the oh, growth yeah, of absolutely. this band. You see, and that's the kind of minutia that I enjoyed reading about the involvement of Neil and Sean in the minute, minute detail that we read about it. I found that absolutely fascinating. And for example, you know, they talk about this Johnny Carson album that almost sunk the band. And you go, what's the connection between Johnny Carson and Kiss? And then you read the details and you go, wow, that is a fascinating story. Now, it's, it's completely minute detail, but that's interesting. That, the, the Coventry stuff was just too much. But yeah, you're right. Now, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how, how much the band should have failed and succeeded in spite of themselves. Yeah. In spite of themselves, yeah. Well, it, it, it's just because they had themselves and a team, management and road crew, that were so devoted and focused on what they were doing that they, they couldn't even imagine failure. I mean, there's just some great comments and stories by the road crew guys here. Which, yeah, and which, did you which, notice one thing, too? Just speaking of those road crew guys, we mentioned Rush. Some of the quotes that they get from the Rush Road Crew guys, if you look at the date, it says Rush Road Crew 1973 to 2013. So they also had a very, um, you know, uh, loyal bunch of guys. And so these bands that have succeeded have these loyal followings that really believe in what's going on. Yeah, it, it, this brings up years ago, um, Jeff Seuss and Kurt Gooch, who did kiss alive forever we're working on a book of uh stories from the original kiss road crew that was supposed mm -hmm. to happen and i just mm -hmm. i don't think they ever found a publisher for it but it now makes me crave that book even more well yeah amazon self-publishing that, me. <laughs> that was that sounded really amazing yeah because it was going to be done through jr smalling i think was the main yeah main person yeah there's just some amazing stories from the road crew in here amazing stories from promoters you know like i had no idea that kiss's booking agent actually put together the deal and financed casablanca did you yeah mm -mm. No never clue. heard that before never heard jeff franklin and ati mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. i I've, I've heard his name i knew his role in the kiss world but this points out that he basically brokered the deal for casablanca with warner brothers he financed a lot of casablanca he kept kiss on the road I'm just like, oh, wow, I never knew this. You know, the right. Warner Brother thing is very interesting because our trivia question for the Kiss fan is, where did the first Kiss song ever appear? And we go, oh, it's on a Warner Brothers compilation. And I always thought that that was the extent of it. I didn't realize that Warner was really behind the band that extensively for those first couple of years. I always thought it was, they did this one single, didn't like it, and that was the end of it. They were behind this. They were supporting Casablanca. They were ready to go, and then it went south. But I didn't really realize that it was Warner Brothers that were that much involved in early Kiss. Well, yeah. And then even the inner, inner workings of the stories about how they ended up recording Kissing Time and yeah. what it was supposed to be, what it ended up being. I mean, there's just... How they got it, talked it, into it and didn't yeah, believe what was being and that, done. But that, uh, that we sort of heard before. But not yeah, but maybe not in that detail. detail. You know, and you hear to, heard it again from all these different perspectives. So for me, By the way, I... We probably mm -hmm. should put a disclaimer on this episode. Like, do not watch if you don't want to have the book ruined for you. Because we are... We're talking about stuff, but we're, yeah, but we're not. It wouldn't make me not want to read it. No. I mean, we're not okay. going through and reading passage after passage. I mean, you know, the, the the thing about this book is, you know, a lot of people will say it's one of the best Kiss books out there is Kiss and Sell by Chris Lent because it's all yes. the business. Yes, it's the best one. Th this is not all business, but you really do get a good dose of what was behind the formation of casablanca and rock steady management and keeping the band on the road you get a good dose of the business you get a nice little dose of in the studio recording as right. well but from mm -hmm. chapter 12 on the first 10 just throw them right out <laughs> waste of time exactly you said it just, very well just skim over the pages and go yeah yeah coventry i got it and then just See, flip Flip 100 pages to the good stuff. The other piece I want to talk about with regards to this book is it gives me hope. And how it gives me hope is we haven't discussed this yet, and this isn't the time to do so, but I want to just make a mention of this 
movie that's coming out because it's, they're talking about it in the press and it's it it's going to be a format similar to the Eagles um, thing that was on Showtime. So anybody, at least from my perspective, I watch all those behind the musics. I love to watch things on different artists, whether I'm a fan of theirs or not. Mm-hmm. This Eagles movie is unbelievable. The detail and the way it was put together, the presentation. And so when I heard that you know Kiss was doing one and it's going to be similar to that, I'm thinking, okay, this is not going to be good because it's going to feel too slighted one way or another. Right. And when I saw this book and with the detail and the number of participants, now I'm actually really looking forward to this movie next summer thinking, you know, this could really actually be a cool thing. It just always seems to me that so much of this stuff is controlled too much, which is why that was so exciting when the Classic Rock Magazine article came out with Paul Stanley. Because it's like, wow, finally something that's fresh and real. That's how this book feels to me. It's fresh and real. And now it makes me feel like, wow, I can't wait to see the movie next summer. I, you well, know, from chapters I, 12 to 36, if, if, if you feel Ken that way. If Ken is involved with that movie, it'll be, it'll be awesome. And it's because Ken's a fan and he cares. And yeah. I trust what he yeah, writes. And by the way, uh, my criticism isn't against Ken. I, I understand as a writer, you throw everything you can, you know, you throw the, in the kitchen sink and then the editors, you know, work it down to something presentable. I don't think the editors did a good job of making those first 10 chapters streamlined and interesting. It's just tedious. Well, so thank God you were not one of the editors, you know, because I, I would feel like I was missing out. You know, I mean, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I, I loved it. I thought it was great. You know, and, and I love the last and, half, and the last two thirds. And when, 12, when the 12 book and on, ended, I'm immediately jonesing for at least part two and part three. There need there needs to be from 1976 to unmasked, unmasking of the band. Mm-hmm. Then there needs to be the entire unmasked era of Kiss, and you could then say another book of the reunion onward. Or 76 this, to you know maybe to the Elder or to Creatures. I just think a logical know. break would be taking the makeup off. Yeah, maybe so. I think a logical. Well, I guess that. I guess we're at the same point because for me, the logical break would be at, up until Ace leaves, and then that little period where they're not really sure where they're going, and then so yeah, basically up until Creatures, and then. But I. But think the, yeah. The the point the point is the format the stories of this book. I want to hear what people have to say of recording rock and roll over and the filming of. Kiss Meets the Phantom, and the solo albums, and all of that, you know, and then Into the Elder, I want to hear all those stories, and then I want to hear what went on during the 80s. You see, and I I agree with you, I want a 76 to 82 book, or whatever the years are going to be, and I I bet you if they went into detail in the minutiae of whatever club, I'll probably find it more interesting because those years are more meaningful to me because I was there and I know the names. If I start reading about Carol Kay, who was you know, their publicist for a while, I'll go, oh, I know that name. So, you know, the, it'll yeah, be a different doesn't it help to get to? But doesn't it also help to get to know new people that you aren't familiar with? That's what was exciting no, to Mitch me. No, Mitch doesn't want new friends. No, 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 but... Some, some, yeah, like finding out about their first manager, Lou Linnett, and, and his stuff I found great. But where they went concert attendee, I'm like, really? I'm a concert attendee. Do you really want my story? I mean, you But know. if they had asked you for your opinion, you would have loved it then. Well, of course. But everybody <laughs> loves to hear themselves. <laughs> no, that's but, the point. The only reason he doesn't like it is it's not his yeah, opinion. Yeah. It's somebody no, else's no, opinion. The reason I don't like it is because they have 100 people give the same opinion, and it's the same story going over and over and over again. But that said... The 1976 to 1980, whatever, when I was a kid and I was following Kiss and I was on top of it and I was reading, you know, all the silly magazines, Tiger Beat, Teen 16, Circus, Hit Parade and all that. And to see how all that stuff was positioned and then to see what really went on behind, to me, is going to be absolutely fascinating. So I'm assuming they're going to do it because why do 72 to 75 and just stop? I mean, I'm sure 76 to whatever is already being written as we speak. It's got to be. It only makes sense. I don't know. 
it makes I'm just glad they didn't do a 72 to 2013. It would have been, you know, a 4,000 page book. And we know Mitch can only stand 250 pages. You're such a hater. I can stand 500 pages when it's all gold. The first 10 chapters are crap. I'm sorry, but it's too long. It's tedious. You could have said the same thing in half the space. This comes from a guy who's got a flight case filled with Rock and roll. Rock and roll all night. <laughs> but I like <laughs> I like music. I, I'm I'm I about the music. I'm about the music. Okay. Anyway. All right, so, so about the music, you know what I'm going to do? Is I'm gonna go create a Spotify playlist for everyone. Okay. That takes into account all of the music that's discussed through the book. Wicked Lester, the demos, the first album. So you can you can listen to these albums and this music while you're reading this, which is a great idea. I love doing that with with music books because it mm-hmm. just paints a whole different picture. Because music brings you back to a memory, a time and place. And if you're reading about it and you're listening to it, I I at least get a deeper connection to what's going on. Yeah, I did that with the Keith Richards book Life, yeah, and we so don't when care. he's in. In recording the first record, Shut listening up, Mitch. to the first record, and it's fantastic. <laughs> it is. I agree with you, Mike. Oh, Mitch is still here. Yeah, hmm. Mitch wants to have, you... Mitch wants a book of the writing of rock and roll all night, so he can just hit it on repeat and listen to it over and over for five hundred. I just want pages. a book with pictures. No, and here's are, the are variation with the Syracuse Neil show. Scott in this. Well, yeah, it's Neil Bogart. Yeah, but are you going to include that in your playlist? Well, if it's on Spotify. Mm-hmm. Probably won't be, but let's hope. You can find it on YouTube, I bet. You can. I checked. I so wanted to listen. Unfortunately, we, we can include Wicked Lester. <laughs> That's another dollar for you, by the way. Um, no, no, no. Wicked Lester was never a tip jar. No. Yes, it was. It was Wicked and Vinny. No. No, just. just oh, there's another there's buck. There's another buck. Right there. You no, but keep I, track I'd like of all this, point. aren't you, Tommy? Mm-hmm. I do like to point out that uh, I did the same thing or I did something similar. As I was reading this book and songs would come out, I would go straight to YouTube and find that song mentioned to sort of uh, get an understanding. So I, I looked over the Neil Scotts. I looked over the, the Naz song. Um, you know, songs like Mama, We're All Crazy Now by Slate, I'm, I'm already familiar with. But the ones that I'm not so familiar with, I, I played along. I made the book interactive with YouTube. Thank you, YouTube. Cool. Oh. YouTube's well, great. You can find that. You can find us. So I think if we were to sum this up, it's two out of three thumbs up. Mm-hmm. You get a thumb up from me from chapters 12 to, to, to 36. And, right. and by the way, you don't get a two thumb and, up. Two and three quarters thumbs up. Two and two thirds. <laughs> Come on, the first third is... is I'll <laughs> hold up a thumb. Tommy, you hold up a thumb. What are you holding up, Mitch? Two thirds. Pecker one. That... one. <laughs> no, there, two, 60... two, two, two thirds is like this. Your your thumb is way up. Oh, that's a hundred percent. I'm 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 at sixty. Oh, you're you're doing a dial. I'm doing a dial. Yeah. Anyway, look. Um, anyway, look. Don't listen to Mitch's opinion. Go get this book. You're gonna and love then tell it. it. Yeah, and that's the that that should be part of the homework is is get the book and then. Come on to the Facebook page or on YouTube or whatever and leave us a comment of how wrong Mitch is. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to bet that 80% are going to agree that the first 10 chapters are tedious. And they're going to agree that the second or the, the, the last two thirds is brilliant. Okay, so how do we manage this? Because I disagree. I disagree too. I think that people are 80% I'm not, that, But that's the homework. They're going to read this, and, they're, and you're going to see the comments, and they're going to say, you know what? Mitch was right. The and, first and, 10 and, and chapters went on and on and on. And if, and if on Mitch is wrong in this, what, what happens? I'll just delete their comments. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You little Hitler. <laughs> God. I don't know. That's the thing. i got to think about it. I'm just not sure. We got Mitch has got to do something if he's wrong. Oh, if he listen, doesn't get... If people think it's great, then God bless them, you know, or whoever. But that's not what this is about. This is about you saying at least 80% of the people are going to agree with you that the first 12 chapters. Okay. I I believe that people are going to say. And and what does he have to do if it isn't? We we need a a 
very clear comment of I agree or I don't agree. Yes. So there's no trying to figure out what you meant. So we can just total up the agrees and I don'ts. Yeah, you can throw in whatever you want to say, but at the end of your post. I agree with Mitch I agree or with I Mitch. Agree, disagree with Mitch. Mitch, one or the other. Because then when we tally up, maybe he has to hold up a sign that says I'm wrong. That's good. Well, I'm not wrong. It's only my opinion. but. <laughs> and as Mike points out all the time, nobody's wrong with opinions. It's just opinions. That's true. No, but come we still on, want to rub Mitch's face in it. <laughs> yeah. All I'm saying is that the first twelve dance. chapters yeah, could have been the first twelve chapters could have been the first two chapters. There was there was ten chapters oh, worth of nonsense. God no. Yes. The Coventry, the Coventry, the Coventry. The Mitch Coventry. wants one the paragraph. The day, the Mitch days. wants one paragraph about the loft, one paragraph about the Coventry. But it was Why'd the same story. Oh, one one paragraph about 79. the demos. Yeah, that, remember the book the that came same. out in the late seventies, the real kiss, and it had a picture of like the dynasty photos on it. Hold, hold and on, it was just hold on, keep talking. Total fluff. That's what it sounds like you want. No, because again, the the other chapters move the story along. It's chapters twelve to the end are very detailed. There's a lot of minutiae, but it's minutiae of different stories. Chapters 1 to 10, just turn around the Coventry. Over. I have that. That's a good book. It turns no, it's out over not. and over and over and over. It tells you nothing about the band. I don't mind the, I don't mind the concept. It's a photo book. I love photo books. You don't have there's to not a lot of Because there's not a lot of reading. Yeah. That's right. Reading sucks. <laughs> no, listen. This is, what, this, is, this is what Mitch likes. February 20th, 1974. The review in Variety. Kiss will be hard act to follow. Next chapter. Yeah. That's no, the extent of listen. it right there. Uh, as always, you're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, these people, folks, I don't know how I work with I, these two. I, I actually, mean, you know, I always love these pictures. I do. That ace one's awesome. Looks like Tommy. Again, let me go over this again. The detail, the minutia, and the way Ken sets up the interviews from chapters 12 to 36 works because the story is moving along. We are progressing from Casablanca to the albums to the, the, the story is moving along. Chapters 1 to 10 is like having your wheels in the mud and you're just spinning over and over and over and over. And it's the same two fucking stories told 700 different ways. That's why it's annoying. It's annoying because Mitch didn't get to tell the story. No. If Mitch it's told it's the, the story, it would have been awesome. It's because it's the same story. They're trying to pull the reader in so that he, he or she They're understands. They're painting the picture of what's going on. They're bringing you into the loft. You're joining the group of people hanging out in the loft. You're but smelling, I don't want to. You're, but I do. Yeah, this is a thousand-piece puzzle. To put together, and you want a two hundred and fifty piece puzzle where the pieces are this big and they're all Mitch numbered just wants to, to where they go. Put together the outside of the puzzle and forget about <laughs> exactly. the, uh, the middle. Doesn't matter doesn't what the listen. full the picture really is. I'll be perfectly honest. If it wasn't for this podcast, I would have given up on this book after the first ten chapters. I would have given up after the first oh, four see, chapters. See, quite I honestly, would, I would not then. You forced that, me. I to would read not take this. that as a two thirds thumbs up. Then that's a thumbs down. You would have given up on this if you didn't have to talk about Keep it. Going. Yeah, absolutely I would have. Because the first few chapters so are boring. Now, having said down. that, the last two-thirds were fantastic because the story moves. But you, you get only from got point to eight that of, because you were forced to. Otherwise, you would have given up and walked away. Absolutely. So that's a thumbs down in my book. Okay. Quite, quite possibly. I guess so. You're probably right. But the story moves from point A to point B in chapters 12 to 36. In chapters 1 to 12, it goes from point A to point A1 to point A2 to point A3 to point A4. It's like I would, oh, I would mute them, guys, if I could, but I can't. Just leave me alone. <laughs> anyway, go buy the book. Yeah, go buy the book. Go buy the book. So there you have it. That's the review. That's our review. So should we move on to Mitch's... Kiss shockers from, from Mitch's, Mitch's locker. locker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? That's the name. You know what? Mitch. He may look insane. Mitch. 
Well, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about books, and so uh, I decided today to talk to be a book. Now, I have two it's books that I keep in my room, and I'm, I'm sure I showed you the other one, so I'm going to go with this one today. I'm pretty sure I haven't shown you. It's a Kiss on Tour by Julian Gill at kissfac.com. Mm. And uh, this one really delves into the minutiae. It goes in from... Um, yeah, no you shit. If you, if you couldn't get through the first ten chapters in this book, how do you get through Julian's books? I, I got to tell you, I like the way Julian writes. I, I like the minutia that I like. I guess he 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 hits that's the part. That's nothing against I Julian. Like. I, I need to say because, but his books are so deep and factual. Right, which is great. Yeah. So then, please explain but, to me know, what is it about Julian's writing then that works more for you? Because this is just a combination of stories all pieced together in the right way. Right, but Julian's books gets to the point, and Julian gets to what I like in Kiss when he starts talking about all the demos and what song. That's what I like. When he starts talking about the shows and the tours, that's what I like. And it's, it moves along and it gets right to the point of this is the show, this is what happened, and this is what was next. And it's contextualized. The, 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 the Ken Sharp book, those interviews aren't in context. And so it does disturb me when I read in Ken's book Gene saying stuff about Ace and Peter because the year in which he said it does change the meaning. You know? So... I just like the way Julian writes, and I like his website. Am I not allowed to like Julian's writing? No, website? this has nothing to do with Julian. It's the Julian haters. You are no, Julian. Haters. <laughs> <laughs> Julian haters. One, no, two. I love Julian's. Anyway, books. Yeah, this is, no, this this is, is a about I downloaded them all as ebooks. God. Kiss on tour by Julian Gill. So that's my. Uh, what I want to know is how does he get away with putting a picture like this on the cover and not getting sued? That's what I want to know. He took the photo. He's the photographer. Yeah, and I guess that was before Kiss made you sign over the rights. Because now they have, when you go to a Kiss show, that you, you sign a, or not even Kiss, Aerosmith and all of them, you sign saying that's if you, can you use are, the picture. That's if you are a photographer at the show. If you're just out in the fan, as a fan in the second row and you take a photo... But what about copyright and marketing? I mean, yeah, he took it. But, I mean, you're not supposed to be able to monetize that picture. I mean, you, I, I, he can't take this and make big, giant posters and sell posters because he's, he's breaking copyright. I mean, that's... Why? I, I there, mean, I don't, there are many photographers who take photos at shows and sell prints of their photos. Right, but yeah. they're not supposed... Legally, they're not supposed to. They, they get away with it because Kiss can't... I'm not talking about no. Kiss. I'm talking about every band Anybody. out there. There's right. photographers you can go to, and you can hey, here's Rolling Stone, here's Cheap Trick, here's Metallica, here's. Oh, I agree, it happens. But if those bands were more vengeful or more, you know, they had a more interest in pursuing them, they could shut them down if they I wanted. I think to. so. I think as the photographer, you have the rights to your film. Only in the public, not in a private context. An indoor venue is not a public because you had to buy a ticket to get in if i take a picture of kiss in the park you know they, they're strolling through central park in their makeup for whatever reason i take that picture i own it because it's in a public place but if i have to pay an entrance fee i'm now at a private performance it's, it's a different copyright that that's sort of how it works Why in fact that is un 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 that's how it works in canada the states i don't know about the states diary of the month. So, let's sum this up. I am right, and you are wrong. There are two thumbs up to one thumbs down. It's a partial thumbs up. The rest of the book is brilliant. The beginning is horrible. Sorry, Ken. And why wasn't I interviewed? God damn it. It would have been a thumbs up if you were. Yeah. No, no. Not if they had been tedious in, in the presentation as it was. Anyway, I'm hoping the uh, finished version will be uh, a little more streamlined and palatable. I'll just keep going. So, there are some great, great pictures in here, too. Like, you know, look at this. Kiss pieing the guys in Rush. Yeah, that's fantastic. But there was a camaraderie. There's no pieing Aerosmith because Aerosmith were not very, very nice. And there's a whole thing about Cadillac High. Hmm. 
What if one of us interviewed somebody who was at Cadillac High? That could be interesting, don't you think? Nah, those stories have been told a million times over. I think that would be fascinating. Hmm. Tommy, help me here, please. Oh, it's the segment almost <laughs> over. <laughs> Are we done with Kiss Shockers? Oh, look, they spoke to Andy Doback, who was an attendee at a Kiss show. Fuck cares. Leave me alone. I do. I do. Oh, Christ. I'm going to go listen to a show from St. Louis in 2009 now. I bet they'll play rock and roll all night. Now, I bet it'll be awesome, like I always. I think it'll be the encore. <laughs> I bet they play oh, Detroit know. Rock City. Hmm. Hmm. Probably Shout It Out Loud. Probably awesome. Love Gun. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <sighs> Just remember, folks, Tommy's the one who wants to replace Gene with Tommy Thayer. That has nothing to do with the book. You no, just, but you're trying to, he's trying to divert. And, the, and the, question, the question was, what would you like to see for an, a lineup? So I thought I'd mix it up and do something different. Whoop oh, I do. love the minutia of this book, but I want to have Eric Singer play on Hotter Than Hell. Tommy. <laughs> really? That's the best you can do? Oh, no, there's more. <laughs> a lot more. Wait, he's going to log in under his alias on Facebook, and he's going to start slamming you on our... Facebook wall. <laughs> That's right. Ace Fraley uh, YouTube page. That's me. No, it's not. Should be, though. Mitch Davey. <laughs> hey, John. Seriously, we, we got nothing against you, John. No. Should we not, talk not at rumors? All. Let's talk rumors. Okay. Well, do you want to tell them something? Because they're just all dying to know about all this September stuff you 24th. keep bringing up. Yeah. You're the no, one I that can't keeps talk about September you're, you're the one that keeps <laughs> dropping it, and then let's talk rumors. Oh, I can't talk about it. Yeah, I can't talk September 24th yet, but I will soon. Be Can you on the 25th? Oh, I will on the 23rd. <laughs> It'll be all over my Facebook on the 23rd. Okay. Hopefully people will care. As much if as they you don't, care about the first 12 chapters of the book. <laughs> I'm assuming a little bit more. Well, that could be a lot of minutia there. Yeah. Make it short and sweet and to the point. Oh, it will be. Okay, so is that it? Are we done? I think we're is done. So, so go out, get your book. Seriously, I think it's a great Rip read. out the first 10 chapters. Ignore what Mitch said. <laughs> read chapters read 12 it. to 36. Tell us what you think. Do you agree or disagree? With Mitch. With Mitch? Yeah. At the end of, you can say whatever you want, post whatever you want, how you feel about the book, but you got to say, agree with Mitch, do not agree, because we want to be able to and, tally and this up. And I, I don't know when, but very shortly we will be doing a contest to give away some books. I'm just oh, waiting for the books to, books to arrive, and then we'll figure out what the contest is. But yeah, we want to hear what you think of the book. What is it a good read? Was it a bad read? I mean, there's a lot of fans that are already skeptical that it's just another Gene and Paul and it's not of history, and it's not. No, it's not. not. At all. That's guys, why I said I have hope for the movie. It was. It's a great read. It's a fun read. There's lots of stories. There's there's pictures we haven't seen before. There's stories we haven't heard before. Mm-hmm. And detail. Yeah. Lots of detail. Wonderful detail. Minutia. Minutia. Chapters worth of it. Mm hmm Leave your comments at Facebook.com slash three sides of the coin, three sides of the coin dot com, YouTube. Tommy will pick one of those comments. And Is this we'll, becoming a weekly thing now? It's a weekly thing, yes. Every okay. week you've got to pick well, a comment. Because we, we were kind of talked about it, but I didn't know that that's what we agreed, so I grabbed the other one thinking that may happen. But all Tommy right. doesn't listen very well. Sometimes as good as Mitch. Yeah, that's about <laughs> it. You know, God. Uh, God gave rock and roll to you. Gave rock and roll to you. Put it in the soul, everyone. Oh, another shitty song. Oh. I love that song. Me too. It's awesome. 
Yeah, I love it loud. Nothing to lose. The Making of Kiss, 1972 to 1975. Thumbs up to this book. Go get it. Later, Carol. guys. Bye.